Hi everybody, welcome to the next lecture on computer animation. Today about OpenCV, animation and rotation. So let's start with OpenCV. Uh, this is a library to, um, to access the camera and it can be used to capture texture from images, for instance, um, if you want to map something on our virtual objects or stream a video live as textures, like uh, for instance, you have a virtual world with a window and um, outside this window, you see the real world or the other way, other way around for augmented reality. So this is basically where we have a virtual object and place it somewhere in the real world, uh, which is captured from this camera. Or we could um, add information to um, objects in the real world. So we can use Python OpenCV for this. Um, so for this we have to install the OpenCV library using this command in Linux sudo apt install python-opencv and then in our Python script or program we then import the cv2 library like this import cv2. So if we have a USB webcam connected to our computer and it is on the default port zero, which it usually is if you just have one camera, we get a pointer to it with this command. Cap, this is the pointer to the camera capture, equals cv2.videocapture0. So video capture, zero, video capture is a function inside the library cv2 which then creates the pointer to this camera zero and cap then is an object which uh, delivers you several functions. For instance, cap read accesses the camera and returns the frame, the current frame that the camera captures and a binary value red, which is true if it was successful and false if it failed to access the camera. Yeah, so then after this command, frame contains our color image in our in BGR format. So that's a peculiar peculiarity from OpenCV that uh, it first has blue, then green, and then red. So these are the primary colors in this order. And the coordinates 0, 0, are in the upper left-hand corner. Right, so that's also typical OpenCV. So we can then display this frame in a window on our computer using the imshow function. So cv2.imshow, here in the first argument we have the title of the window that opens and then frame displays um, the frame that we just captured. We can also save it as a file, for instance in JPEG format, using the command in write. So the first argument then gives us the name of the file that it writes to and then the second argument is the frame, the image that we want to store. So to open the window for display and keep it open until we press Q, we, uh, we still need um, some time. So that's why we have this infinite loop. So this if infinite loop calls the wait key function. So the wait key function waits for key input and it also keeps um, the imwrite window open. So it has this combined function. And here I also use it to um, close the window when I press the key Q. So when I press the key Q then uh, wait key returns the ASCII key, um, ASCII value of the key Q and this um, ASCII value should be identical um, to um, what the key Q, um, yeah, so ORT of Q is again the ASCII value of this key. So if what wait key de delivers is the ASCII code of Q, then we want to break this infinite loop. Yeah, and this um, end FF means uh, we just have this mask for uh, the lowest um, the lowest h bits of our code. So this ignores ignores the higher bits because the ASCII code only 
has eight bits. Yeah, so here's an example for taking a photo. So this is this program image recdisp.py. And let's take a look at it. So let me go to my terminal. Here we have our terminal with our examples. And you can make the font a little bigger. So here you go. And then we first can open it in an editor, gedit image rec disp. And here you can see it. So it's actually fairly simple. You can see we start with import cv2, then we access the camera, here the pointer, here we do the reading from the camera, here we display this frame, and then we store it in this file, pi color photo. And then we have this infinite loop, which we keep open until I press the key Q, and this should actually be on the same level as the if. Yeah, and when we are done, then we release the camera and destroy the windows. So let's see what it's doing. So now I'm executing it with Python 3. Uh -huh. It has an expected indent. Ah, yeah, okay. It's below if, so we need to have an indent here. Yeah, so this is the image I just took. I just pressed the Q to close it again. And then we can actually take a look at um, the file that we just created. I'm using ls list minus l for long to see the um, to see the, um, the time of the modification. Let's see, here we had the name pyphoto.jpg. So let me copy it, go back to my window, paste it here. Yeah, and you can see here, we have a file with size 500 kilobytes, and it's, um, yeah, so it's uh, the current time. So this is what I just um, captured. And I can also display it using an Ubuntu Eye of Gnome. And here, pi color. And then check it out. Yes, so that's me in front of the camera. So that worked. Okay. So this is a single frame, which we can take. We can also stream and display a video we only need an endless loop for recording and displaying. So here's a, a test for it. Here we have again this um, access of the camera and then the cap read is now inside an infinite loop as you would expect from a video, right? We wanna have continuous capture of videos and here it captures a frame and it displays a frame until we decide to press the key Q. And then we have this break. And again, we need to have this indent here. And this is what we can see here then in this example. So let me first open it, copy, edit. So here you can see, yeah, so here we have the correct indent of the break. Here we have this infinite loop. So it captures the frame and displays it right after it. And notice that there is um, no delay in it. So that means the computer captures and displays the frame as fast as it can. So here, the frame rate that we get as a result depends only on the speed of the computer. So that's something we need to keep in mind, um, particularly when we store it to a file, right? When we store it to a file as a video, we need to define a frame rate. Um, the same also for the playback. 
Here we don't need it because it's all in real time, but we need to keep in mind that the frame rate here only depends on the speed of the computer. So if you have a fast computer, we will have a high resolution video. Okay, so let's try it. So I'm executed with executing it with Python 3. And you can see I have a very high resolution camera. So that means we get a very low frame rate because of this extremely high resolution camera. So let me press Q. So that's also something um, to keep in mind. Um, the speed that your computer can process um, the frames also depends on the resolution that you have in your camera. When you have a low resolution camera, you um, will have a higher frame rate. And actually CAP also, uh, or video, uh, the CV2 um, provides functions to set the camera resolution, uh, which we will see in a moment. Yeah, so here the next example, we can record and display a video. Um, so for that we need an endless loop for recording and for displaying. To save a video, we have to specify the format, then the frame rate, which I set here to 20 frames per second. It's quite common frame rate. And also a resolution, right? And we generate a pointer. Here we have CV Video Writer 4CC. This is the format um, for storing it. And here I have my video writer. So this writes our video to this MP4 file using this format that I specified here in the for first line, this compression format. Then here I'm specifying the frame rate, the 20 frames per second. And here is the resolution with width, width and height. And then we can write our frames into the video file with this command out dot write of frame. So remember here out was this pointer to the file or this object, this file object, which includes the compression format. And then it takes as input the frame to compress and write it to the file. So this is actually very convenient because all the compression functionality is hidden in this object, in this video writer object. And then this is in this example video rec file display. So let me open it. Copy, copy, control C. So you know, it had a return in it. So let me open it with gedit. So here you can see it. And here you can also see how to set the resolution. So here I have my capture object to the camera and then I can use cap set to set um, the resolution. So here, this is the horizontal resolution with argument three. So this has the key three, here we have four. So this is horizontal and four is vertical, 1024 pixels times 576 pixels vertically. So this means I don't have the full resolution of my camera, but a reduced resolution for our capture and file storing. Here I'm also um, um, using the if command to see if red was successful. And if it's not successful, then I print no camera found as a warning. Right, that helps uh, sometimes to find an error. Um, otherwise, it gives uh, sometimes cryptic error messages. So this is a more clear error message. Yeah, here it prints um, the actual height and width as a reminder. Here it defines the format, the compression format. Here it is doing um, the storing of each file, of each frame. Um, well, first it creates this object and then here in this infinite loop, it's doing the reading here, the displaying in the frame and here finally it's doing the storing. So here I'm creating my file and compression object out 
and here I'm using this object with a function write to write the current frame. Right. So what this infinite loop is then doing is reading a frame, showing a frame, and writing a frame. And here this outright is also taking care of the 20 frames per second. Right. So here basically this takes care of the timing. So a very convenient function with many functionalities combined into one. And then it records it until I hit the key Q again. And then it breaks and then it releases the capture and also the out file and destroys the window. So here it closes the file without release. Right? And this is important to, in order not to corrupt um, the video file. If you would um, not use this break, but um, say control C to finish it, then you might corrupt the video file, which we don't want. So let's try. So here we now use you know, Python 3. Oh. Yeah, now it's already recording. Let's see. Right, so here's my video. Hello. So now you can see it's moving. It's actually a video. And now I hit the key Q. And now it's done. So let's see what it produced. So here it should produce this file here. Video rec. Copy. Let's see. LS minus long. And here we can see we have a file of 1.5 megabytes and I just recorded it. So this is what I just did. Um, we can now take a look at it, for instance, with VLC, which is a very common video program. And see what we got. Yeah, and you can see here's the resulting video of course, without sound, because we didn't record any sound. So here I can close it. But usually we also want to be able to um, use the video in our programs. And for that, we can use um, this example here. So to play back a video from the file, we open the file instead of the capture device. So it's again here, this video capture function, cv2.videocapture. But instead of having now a, a, the camera, now we are using the name of the file. So here, this is str, which means string. And this is this arc vector of one. So this is the first argument that we specify to the program, which should be the file name of the video. Right, so then video capture gets the file name of the video as a string, as it should be. So then we have to pay attention to the right timing for the playback. For 20 frames per second, it's 50 milliseconds per frame. And here we use it in the wait argument of wait key. Right? Remember here we don't have uh, this information. Um, we could read it out of the video file, this information of the frame rate. So in this case, we don't read it out of the video frame. We just know it. And that's why we can just enter the 50 milliseconds here in the wait key function. So here the 50 is 50 milliseconds. Yeah, and then we can take a look first at this example. Copy. We edit. And here you can see it. It's actually fairly simple. Here we open the video file. Here we're doing the cap read. So now we read from the file instead of from the camera. Here we show it. And we do it either until the file is done or until we break. And here we can see here's the wait key 50. 50 milliseconds to get the same speed for the playback as for the recording. So let's try it. So Python 3, and we need to specify the name of our file, 
which is video rec mp4 copy so yes and you can see it's nicely displaying the recorded video as it should be again without sound yeah, okay, so this, that should be it for it for this um, video recording and um, displaying example. So let's come to the next topic, animation. So animation fits to um, videos, right? We now want to get movement into our uh, virtual objects. Here again, literature and references. And yeah, so the simplest form of animation is um, relative motion of complex, non-deformable objects, right? So if we have, say, a teapot, we can move this teapot or rotate this teapot, for instance. Or we can also have a camera movement instead of moving the object. Advanced options are deformation of objects. These would be rigid objects with joints, uh, like our arms, for instance or the deformation of soft, soft objects, um, like for instance, clay. Um, this can be done with physical simulation or particle animation. So animation techniques are the keyframe animation. So basically it's like a movie. Then we have kinematics. For instance, when we have joints, uh, they limit the movement. Then we have motion capture, for instance, if we have actors and we have sensors to capture their motion. Then we have physical animation and dynamics, for instance, if we um, um, simulate gravity and objects falling. Um, we will have multi-resolution animation, so that's basically the same principle as for the objects, the 3D objects, and layered animation, um, also very similar to 3D objects. Then we have an application depending on the field of application, the camera movement, character animation, and so on. So here, the keyframe animation, like a movie. So the goal is to determine the position and location of all objects for each frame. The procedure here is the definition of parameters in important keyframes, for instance, start and end frames of movements. Then we have the interpolation of the movement of the motion in the intervening images or in betweening. So we have start point, end point, and then we can um, estimate where the object is in between if we assume um, a continuous movement. So this is similar to the procedure for animated films. And the uh, question is, how do we do the interpolation? Right. And the simpler approach would be the independent interpolation of each parameter. For instance, independent interpolation of the coordinates x, y, and z, or interpol independent interpolation of pen tilt, tilt and roll angles for a rotation. But the result is an unsatisfactory motion sequence. So often that's not natural. Semantic relationships between the individual parameters are not taken into account in this way, and that's why they appear unnatural. And this is only suitable for, for very simple movements. Better is a keyframe animation based on parametric curves. So again, similar to um, 3D objects, where we have parametric curves to model surfaces, here we use them to model uh, motion trajectories. Yeah, or the path animation. So the parametric curve is used as the motion path, and with it we have an interpolation of the curve parameter between the keyframes. So here we have a consideration of complex sem semantic relationships, uh, relationships between object parameters, and a simplification of the control of the animation process. And this is again a spline-driven animation. So splines that we already know from approximating surfaces. 
Yeah, so how do we do it? We control the animation through two curves. Q of U is the position of the object in space depending on the parameter, the helper variable U. Right, so Q is in 3D space and this parameter U tells us where on some um, curve we are in space. Similar V of U gives us the velocity of the object on this curve depending on this helper parameter u. So the velocity here um, is um, then 2d. Yeah, so prerequisites for this is a linear, linear relationship between the arc length of the curve and the parameter u as an arc length parameterization. So. Unfortunately, this relation is usually nonlinear for splines, right? Since splines are polynomials of third order, they are nonlinear, right? We have a polynomials of degree greater than one. So the goal would be to simplify the control of the velocity or also the position along a parameter curve. And the approach is the parameterization pro proportional to the curve length, right? So here, instead of having the parameter u, we, we use the length of the curve. And then we know if we increment u by a certain amount, then it moves at a given um, speed. So to move an object along such parameterized curve, the controller can simply add the product of speed and frame duration to the previous parameter value. That's the advantage here. Yeah, so how is it done? Uh, we have to calculate the curve length s, and s is a scalar since it specifies a length, as a function depending on the original parameter u. Right? So we can specify or compute the s as a function of u, so we call this function a of u. And A is strictly monotonically increasing because U moves our point from beginning to end. Now we just need to calculate the inverse function. So this should actually be a superscript. So let me do that here. Text superscript here to signify the inverse format text superscript same down here superscript yeah, and the rest seems to be okay so let me go back to the full screen mode yeah so here we have this function but what we really need is the inverse function given this arc length so this is what we want to start with. We want to give the arc length and then from that we want to compute the u such, we, such that we can input into our splines. Right. So that also means that this inf inverse function is monotonically increasing for cubic splines. The splines are used here for the temporal interpolation. Insert it into q of u. So this is the, the space location. So we had q of u and instead of u we now have a inverse of s. Right. So then q of s is now parameterized proportional to the curve length. Right. So here q of s and then we have the x coordinate, the y coordinate and the z coordinate each depending on s. And the problem here is that our practical function a or in a inverse can usually not be determined and analytically right so this should actually also be a inverse minus one so text superscript yeah so what can we do well we approximate it numerically so this is what we can see here. So here we have our arc length and we approximate this 
small piece of the arc ds which you can see here so here we have a small piece of the curve and we approximate it by the distance between those two points since the arc might be curved and the distance is straight we make a small error um, but that's okay so here you can see the computation of the distance here q the position and for u plus du so we add a small piece of u to it this is this point minus q of u so here's the starting point q of u and the difference between the two locations is uh, this piece ds and this ds is in 3d remember right these two points are in 3d so that also means the difference is a vector in 3D, but what we're really interested in is, um, which you can see here, dx, dy, dz. So we have a 3D vector here. The ds is the 3D vector. But what we really want to know is the, uh, the distance, right? So here we calculate the magnitude, and this magnitude is simply the Euclidean distance. So remember when we have a rectangular triangle and each of the coordinates are rectangular on each other. So that's why we can compute the distance as each coordinate difference squared, summing them up and uh, taking the square root. Right, so this is our magnitude here. And um, yeah, so this looks a little bit confusing. So let me just delete the first part here yeah so this is this here yeah that looks better originally this s was supposed to be bold face but somehow this bold face got, got lost here yeah, so now we know how to compute the ds uh, from the du, right? And now we can calculate um, the function a of u of the arc length as a function of the parameter u by estimating the derivative. So basically what we just did is we computed the ds, we have the du, and this is basically uh, the s is the a of u, the magnitude of it and then we just plug it in what we just obtained and this is then our result right and that means we can obtain this function a of u by integration or summation when we do it numerically of this derivative so here we have the da of u to du and we obtain it by integrating this derivative Right. We just need to integrate dA to du with respect to u, and then we have it. Right here, dA, dA um, to du integrated with respect to u plus some integration constant, and there should be an equal sign behind it. Yeah, this looks complicated. Somehow this equal sign got lost. Plus a zero, here you go. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. So here's then our final expression, which we then can compute um, numerically. So in general, we have it, um, this is in general not analytically integrable, but we have a numerical solution and we can also use lookup table or compute it in Python with um, scipy integrate quad. Right, this is a very practical function. Yeah, so here, yeah. that makes more sense. Okay, so similar for the speed curves, we describe the distance traveled on the curves as a function of time. 
So here v of u is v of t or and s, so time and position. And t, the time, is a function of u and s, the location is also a function of u. And here we also have new parameterizations and we can apply the same procedure. Yeah. So far we only have the animation of the translation, but we would also like to have an animation of the position in space um, with pen, tilt and roll. So the orientation. Right. And for that we have three main options. Um, the Euler angle, the rotation matrices and quaternions. So this is um, uh, how we specify um, an orientation. Right, so maybe I can call this orientation. That makes it more clear. Yeah, so first is basically the most straightforward using the so-called Euler angles. This is the indication of the position or the orientation of an object by rotation angles for rotation around the x, y, and z axis. So let me call this again orientation. Yeah, and this is simple, but it depends on the order of the rotations, right? So each axis has a rotation, but you cannot simply swap them because then you get a different result. And there's also a problem with the so-called gimbal lock. We have a loss of one degree of freedom, freedom under certain circumstances in a gimbal, right? So we have a rotation around one axis might be called are cancelled by a rotation around another axis. And this happens with a rotation by 90 degree uh, around any axis, because if we rotate by 90 degree, then we are, we are basically parallel to another axis. And due to successive rotation around the different axes, two rotation axes coincide with each other. And that means one degree of freedom is lost. So that means it's not unique. So here you can see it. So on the left hand side, you can see, well, this is this gimbal, right? And this corresponds to the Euler angle. So each of um, these um, joints represents an axis. So here, first axis, second axis, third axis. And if we um, then align this second axis with a um, uh, such that it appears in parallel to this first one. Basically, we can rotate the first axis and the last axis, we can, this one here, we can counter rotate. And that means we always get the same position, but with different angles, right? Another problem, we have the interpolation between two rotation values, which does not really work. Rotations around the three axes are not independent of each other in contrast to translation. <coughs> and that also means uh, rotations are not commut commut commutative, which you can see here in this picture, right? So here two rotations <coughs> are just switched and we get a quite different result. No. But mathematically, they're very convenient because we can represent them using rotation matrices. So here you can see a rotation with Euler angles uh, and they correspond to the multiplication of coordinates with trigonometric functions as in this matrix here. So ro the rotations can also be represented as a matrix multiplication in homogeneous coordinates as we see here. So the last column here is for um, the homogeneous coordinate. And these homogeneous coordinates, they incorporate a translation into the rotation matrix by this uh, auxiliary coordinate. So here you can include a translation. Yeah, and here you can see S and C, and they are for the sine and the cosine of the different angles. 
we have three axes, so we have three different sines and cosines for the different angles phi i. So here we have three rotation angles, phi, um, phi 1 to phi 3, and they are just incorporated in this rotation matrix together possibly with a, a translation. So mathematically very convenient. So we just need to multiply each point in 3D with the homogeneous coordinates coming from the left hand side here, multiplied by this matrix, and then we have the rotated and translated result. Here you can see special cases. Here we have a rotation only around X. The corresponding rotation matrix looks like this. Here we have a rotation only around Y, so the other phi's are zero. This is the result. And here for the rotation just around Z, and this would be the result. Yeah, so problems are that rotations around the coordinate axis um, yeah, this is the only possibility that we have. Uh, so rotations must be composed of them. So any rotation we need to represent by rotations around the coordinate axis, which sometimes is not so straightforward and it's not always unique, right, which we saw. That me and also rotation matrices are not effectively interpolated. The interpolation of a rotation matrix does not give a rotation matrix. Right, so if you interpolate those cosine and sine values, uh, that means we not necessarily get another rotation matrix. So the interpolation of angles often gives wrong results. Yeah, so an approach to solve the problem is rotations not only around the coordinate axis, but around a freely selectable rotation axis by a certain angle. So now we have, instead of three angles, we have just one angle and a rotation axis. So the rotation is def defined by this axis. This is a unit vector in space, so it has unit length. So basically it means we just have uh, two parameters left, since we have unit length, and then we have this angle of rotation around this axis. So again, three parameters describing the orientation. And this leads to the so-called quaternions. Yeah, so what are quaternions? They are a generalization of the complex numbers first described by Sir William Rowan Hamilton in 1843. It's an extension of the plane of complex numbers to a four-dimensional space. Remember complex numbers, real and imaginary part, they are 2D. It's not enough for our uh, virtual worlds of 3D, but quaternions have 4D, so that's enough. It's actually one more dimension than we need. And here's the definition. So instead of having just real and imaginary, we have an imaginary part, and then we have uh, we have a real part and we have two or uh, three imaginary parts. Right, and here it's actually, this should be bold. This should be bold and this should be non-bold. Yeah, because bold I use as an um, indication of the imaginary part. So here we have those three imaginary numbers. And as we are used to, each imaginary number squared is minus one. So i square equals j square equals k square equals minus one. And what's special here is that also the product i, j, k is also minus one. Right. So if we have those mixed um, imaginary components um, and multiply them, we also get a minus one. Yeah, and this is basically what defines the space of quaternions. And actually from this definition, we can derive all the necessary properties. So we can use this above equation and um, we multiply it with minus k, this one here, and then we get ij equals k. 
right? So multiply this with minus k from the right hand side, then we have i, j, k times minus k. We know k squared is minus one, then we have k times minus k is one, then we have i, j equals k, right? Because minus one times minus k is k. So then we get this. Similarly, we can show that j i equals minus k. So again, this should be bold phase. And similarly, um, ij equals minus ji. And that means it's not commutative, right? Unlike um, what we're used to in the complex plane, complex plane and the usual complex plane is commutative. Here it's not. So that's also special here. We also have this abbreviated notation. Each, co um, each quaternion can be represented as a scalar and a vector, v. And this v is then, can be seen here, we have v t vx times i, vy times i, vz times i. Uh, so this also doesn't look too good. So this should be bold phase. This should be bold phase. This should also be bold phase. This should be subscript. Format text. Subscript. This should also be subscript. Format text subscript and this should also be subscript yeah so these are the three components of our vector v each component denotes one of those imaginary parts so again make them bold face so this also shows how they can be applied to our 3d worlds here we have three imaginary comp components and they correspond to our three dimensions in space, right? So here we can see those, um, this vector v it can be seen as a three-dimensional vector in space. And this actually will be our rotation axis. So v is then our rotation axis in 3D. Right. Yeah, so here more computation rules for quaternions. Um, I guess I can skip them here. Interesting is also the cross product u times v that we are using in this um, previous calculation here of the multiplication. So the multiplication of two quaternions then results in this cross product u cross v. Right? And remember u and v are the vectors in 3D and they represent our rotation axes. And the multiplication of two quaternions will result in the concatenation of two rotations. So if we have then two rotations in our 3D world, that results in the cross product of our two rotation vectors. And fortunately, we can easily derive the rotation using this formal determinant. So you can see it here again is our three imaginary units, i, j, k. And here we have the three components of our uh, rotation vectors. So here are the three components of vector u and here of vector v. And if you compute the determinant, um, the symbolic determinant, which we can, for instance, compute using the open source software maxima, then we obtain the resulting cross product vector. Yeah, so here are some more rules. So we still have the associative law. If you have a product of three quaternions, q1 to q3, then it doesn't matter if you first multiply the first two and then the last one, 
or first the last two and then multiply the first one to it from the left hand side. But it's not commutative, it does not apply as we saw. We can also define a conjugate like in the complex numbers. So here if you have a, a quaternion you, with a three complex units, then the conjugate uh, is simply flipping the signs of the imaginary parts. So basically the same as uh, for the normal complex um, numbers. Then we can also def define a quaternion norm using the conjugate that results in q times q conjugate and then the square root of it. So basically the same rule as for complex numbers. And that's the same as um, the square root of the sum of the squares of the components, all the components of the quaternion. Yeah, so here's the connection to the 3D world. We have the simple mapping, just using those three imaginary components as x, y, and z coordinates. And in this way, we can define rotations with an angle around a rotation axis, which we specify with a unit vector in the i, j, k coordinates. So this is our um, rotation axis. Yeah, then we still need to specify this angle phi using the right-hand rule um, where we use the thumb as a rotation axis. So when we take the right hand, the thumb is a rotation axis, and then our fingers point in the direction of this angle um, psi. Right, and here you can see the angle is then um, embedded in into the real part of the quaternion as cosine phi over two and as a factor for our rotation vector, sine of phi over two. And here this vector n represents the axis of rotation. And we can concatenate rotation simply by multiplication of the corresponding rotation quaternions. So again, that's very convenient. Yeah, so here's the procedure. We have our, a point or vector to be rotated. We can, um, trans, uh, we can basically map it to a quaternion P, right? Then we can represent the rotation as the quaternion QR. So P is our point to be re, um, rotated as a quaternion. Again, the three um, uh, coordinate axes are then the three imaginary axes. And then we apply the rotation by quaternion multiplication with a rotation quaternion and its conjugate. So here you can see the point as a quaternion. And then we multiply the rotation quaternion from each side. And from the right hand side, it's a conjugate version. And then we obtain the new point P prime, and then we can transform them back to 3D coordinates. Yeah. Alternative, the quaternion rotation can also be calculated with non-normalized quaternions by replacing the conjugation by the inverse. So this works as well. Same result, P prime. Yeah. So the reverse procedure is also possible. We can concatenate and interpolate rotations in quaternion space and convert the resulting rotation quaternion into a rotation matrix and then applying the rotation matrix in 3D space. So here we would first take all the rotations that we plan to apply, compute the resulting quaternion after multiplying all together and then um, go from quaternion space back into 3D space to a 3D rotation matrix. Yeah, interestingly, we can also represent quaternions as matrices. You can see it. We can represent I, K, J, and the identity as four-dimensional matrices. And they have the same property as those quaternions, right? So I square is minus one, K square is minus or minus identity, I should say. 
and ijk is also minus identity. So that is very convenient because we don't need special types in our programs. We can just use the matrix type um, to represent them. Or similar if we have complex numbers, uh, we can get by with two-dimensional matrices, which might be more convenient. Yeah, so again, that's helpful for an implementation in Python. Yeah, interesting and practical is also that we now can do the interpolation. We can, we can do this interpolation uh, in quaternion space, similar to vector interpolation and translation. So here you can see this interpolation in quaternion space is basically done on the surface of the sphere. So we have rotation vectors, uh, rotation axis, and then we just take those rotation vectors and interpolate on the sphere. Yeah, so here's actually a little example. We have a point P say x equals 0, y is 2, z is 6, and we want to rotate this point by 60 degrees with respect to the z-axis, so this last axis here. So this point as quaternion is this, right? So this x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, now just with a quaternion or uh, complex um, um, vectors or units, and now the rotation quaternion um, is the rotation around the z-axis. So here you can see it. This is 0 for x, 0 for y, and 1 for k for the, for the z-axis. And the 60 degree is in the real part as cosine um, phi over 2. So there should be a phi here or 60. Right. So that means oh, the animation. Yeah, so here is our rotation quaternion then. Right, so here we have cosine of 30 degree, and here we have the sine of 30 degree. And you can see it, so co cosine of 30 degree plus 0.5k. So here, all what's left of n is the k, and the sine of 30 degree is 0.5. Right, so this is all what's left of this q. So that makes it very simple. We only have the real part and one imaginary. So this results in square root of 3 over 2 plus 0.5k. So this is the cosine of 30 degrees. And then we can apply the quaternions to our point q times p times q conjugate. You can see there's a point in our 3D space. We multiply it by the quaternions from the left and to the right. You can see the minus for the conjugate complex. And then if you multiply it out, this is the result, right? And you can see we have square root of 3 times i plus j plus 6k. And this is then the x-axis, the y-axis, the k and uh, the z-axis. And square root of 3 is 1.73. Then we have 1 and 6 for the z-axis. Yeah, and that, that makes sense because uh, we rotate it around the z-axis. So x and x and y should be changed. And this is what we see. Right, so that works. Yeah, so the advantages here is that we have a compact representation of rotations. We have four instead of 16 values for matrices. We have a simple multiplication. The angle and axis can be selected directly, which is often convenient. We have a simple interpolation of rotations. It is numerically stable, um, which means robust against rounding errors. And we have no gimbal lock problem. 
Yeah, and here is an example on how we would implement it in Python. In Python, we have the function gl rotate f. Well, f is for float arguments. And here you can see the first argument is the angle, and then we have x, y, and z for the rotation axis. Right. And the angle is specified in degrees. We specify this function in front of the object to be rotated. So here's an example, solid cube light rotate. So this is the solid cube you already know from the lighting experiments, and now I'm rotating it. So let me first open it, copy, gedit, so here you can see our solid cube example, which here actually is now um, a solid teapot, but we can also select this solid cube, but maybe this solid teapot looks nicer. And here you can see our rotation, right? Here is the GL rotate F, and you can see I rotated it about 40 degrees. And here we have the vector, the rotation vector. So X is zero, Y is one. So here I'm rotating it around the Y axis and Z is zero. So I'm taking the teapot and rotate it around the Y axis by 40 degrees. So we can also take a different axis and a different angle and see what happens. So let's try. Python 3, so here's this teapot with nice green light. And first let's see what happens if we don't rotate it. We just have zero degrees. So now we have zero degrees. This is the starting point. You can see the difference. 40 degrees, say now we try 60 degrees. See, we rotated it um, in the mathematically positive sense by 60 degrees around the y-axis. So here we have the y-axis and we rotated the teapot around the y-axis. So let's also try a different axis. Make this maybe 40 again. And now add another rotation. So now I'm rotating around the x-axis by minus 80 degrees. So now I have two rotations. So let's see. Yeah, so now I rotate it around the x-axis by minus 80 degrees. So now you can see the bottom of the teapot. Yeah, and this also shows how easy it is to concatenate different rotations. Yeah. So depending on how we choose the rotation axis and angle, we rotate the object. The light remains in the position, illuminating different parts as expected, right? We just change the orientation of our object, but not of the lights. Yeah, and the next example is also interesting because this now includes an animation together with rotation and translation. So for the animation, we have to use this function glut idle func, right? Specifying some idle function. And this lets OpenGL continue processing for the animation as an infinite loop without any further input. And in the following example, the function turn teapot increments the rotation angle for each new frame. So let's take a look at it. So it displays the teapot then increments the angle and then displays it again. So the edit. So here you can see it. So here, this is done using a class painter, which basically is a collection of all necessary functions. So here it starts 
with initializing this rotation angle to zero. Then we have this display function. And this display function con um, consists of first uh, drawing the teapot and then turn the teapot by this um, angle one degree. So the argument specifies the increment of the angle. Then we have the draw t. Here this function is then specified with all the necessary functions here. And here you can see the rotate function. Here you have the rotation angle, which we then increment. And here's the rotation axis, the y-axis, as we just used. And here we also in include the translate. Right Here you can see it translates along this vector, 1 for x and 0.75 for y. Yeah, and this then lets us draw the teapot itself. Yeah, and here's the function turn teapot. Right, so this is the function that we called up here, turn teapot by one degree. So here we specified here by this angle of degree and here we increment our rotation angle by the number of degrees. Each time we call it, we have this increment. And if we are larger than 360 uh, or smaller than minus 360, um, we stop, right? Yeah, and then we have this idle function that we just saw. And this idle function just redisplays um, our object. So each time we hit this idle function, we display it again. This can be seen here and then in the main loop. Here I'm opening the window. And here we have the display function itself. Right, so here we have this class painter. And here we initialize the object my painter. This is object painter. So here basically we now create this object with a starting angle zero. And then here in the display function, we call it with a display fun above, right? Here we basically display our teapot. And then here next we see the glut idle fun, my painter idle fun. And here this idle function basically just redisplays um, the teapot with a new angle. And then it basically goes back here. So each time it displays, adds a new angle, displays, and so on. Again, as fast as it can do. So here I didn't specify any uh, frame rate, um, no, um, no delay. So it just displays um, the video as fast as it can. So it also means uh, we have uh, the animation appear on different computers in different speeds. So when you have faster computer, it will appear faster. So let's see what it does. So here I have Python 3. Also note that I don't include any lighting here. So this is just a frame wire model. Yeah, and this is the result. You can see it nicely rotating. So it's offset from the center, right? So the center is kind of like where the handle is now, and then it rotates around this, this handle, right? Yeah, and this rotation speed basically only depends on the speed of your computer. So you can also try it on your computer and in this way estimate how fast your computer is. And here in this case, you close with a cross here. Yeah, so, right, so this should basically be it. Thank you for your attention and then see you next time.